All right, well, hey, everybody, welcome to Eagle Brook Church. Really good to have you with us today. We are wrapping up a six-week series called What I Wish I'd Known Sooner. We've covered topics like leadership, toxic people, and true wealth. I wish I would have learned how to lead sooner than I did. I wish I would have learned how to deal with toxic people earlier than I have. Today's message might be the most important of all. Today's message is titled, Do Not Waste Your Life. None of us want to get to the end of our life and go, oh, I wasted a lot of time. None of us want to get to the end of our life and go, oh, you know what? I wasted the gifts and the talents and the abilities that God gave to me. Did you know that the average person in the course of their lifetime sleeps for 229,961 hours? That's about a third of your life. Just like that, gone. The average person eats and drinks for 67 minutes per day. That adds up to 32,098 hours of your life spent eating and drinking. This next, next statistic isn't for all of us. It's about one-third. So one-third of us will spend a full week every year getting ready in the morning. Not all of us, just about a third of us do that, and you know who you are, okay? You don't have to glare at your husband or your wife or your brother or sister. They know who they are, but you are spending about a week every year getting ready in the morning. Here, here's the most depressing of all of these statistics. The average person will spend six months of their life standing in line waiting for things, I fully expect that I'm going to get to heaven one day and Jesus is going to go, you poor soul. You spent two years of your life standing or sitting out in the car waiting for your wife and kids to come on out so that you can go someplace. I fully expect there's going to be some sort of special reward for me in heaven one day. Now, when you start adding all this up, sleeping and eating and getting ready in the morning, there's not a whole lot of time for other things is there? It's one of the reasons why James in the Bible says, what is your life? It's an inter interesting question. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. You won't see that at your next motivational seminar. Tony Robbins is not going to get up and go, everybody, you are a mist. You are a vapor. Another verse says that we're like a piece of grass. We bloom up strong in the spring, we hold on through the summer, and then we die in the winter. Not real encouraging. You're a mist, you're a vapor, you're a piece of grass. Harsh, but reality. I was working out a few weeks ago, and I was watching TV while I was working out, and there was this commercial that came on for Nutrigenics. It was a supplement for men over the age of 40. Now, if I had seen this commercial 10 years ago, I would have laughed. I wouldn't have even paid any attention to it. But I'm 41 years old. So when I heard them say it's for men over 40, I kind of, you know, perked up a little bit. In the commercial, they have Frank Thomas, who's a former Major League Baseball player, whose nickname when he played was The Big Hurt. And so there's this 50-year-old married couple at the fitness center, and the husband looks over and sees Frank Thomas, who's you know, still in pretty good shape. And so he turns to his wife, and he goes, hey, it's the big hurt. And his wife turns to him, and she goes, more like the big hunk. And they go over to introduce themselves. Which I'm like, if that was my wife, I'm going to you know, keep that to yourself, maybe. It was so obvious what they're trying to do in the commercial. They're trying to play into the insecurities of men over the age of 40. But even though I could see right through that, by the end of the commercial, I'm like, oh, I don't know, you know I'm, I am over 40. The very next commercial, I'm not making this up, was for copper fit back braces. By the way, I don't know what I was watching on TV, but clearly my cable company is spying on me and they think I'm washed up. Because the Copperfit ad has Brett Favre and Jerry Rice who crash an adult flag football game. And all the other 40, 50-year-old guys are like, oh, my back. But Brett Favre's got the Copperfit on, so he's just whipping it across the field to Jerry Rice. 
And I'm telling you, at the end of that commercial, I was like, somebody get my wallet. Where's my credit card? My son finally intervened. He said, Dad, if you show up at the gym wearing that, I will never tell people that you are my father ever again. But what's happening here? I'm a vapor. I'm a mist. I'm like a piece of grass that was growing strong in the spring, and now I'm just holding on through the summer months, waiting for winter to come. And that's how it will be for all of us. At the end of our lives, no one is going to say, you know, somebody go down to the bank and, and, and take out all my money and bring it to me. I just want to hold it as I die. I just want to make it rain as I'm passing into eternity. Nobody's going to do that. Nobody's going to say, somebody go get my trophies and my plaques and just line them up for me because I want to look at them as I expire. Very few people are going to say, you know, I, I wish I would have spent less time with my loved ones. I wish I would have spent less time with God. I really wish I would have spent more time scrolling on my phone. I mean, more cat videos on YouTube, please. That, that's what my life was missing. More political opinions on Facebook. That, that's what I needed through my life. Nobody's going to say that. When you're in that hospital bed and the diagnosis is terminal, you will know what really matters in life. Author and pastor Miles Monroe said it this way. He said, the greatest tragedy in life is not dying, but living without purpose. As tragic as it is when someone leaves this earth, especially if it's way too soon, as tragic as that is, he says it's more tragic for a person to live 80 or 90 years, but never discover their God-given purpose. You have one life. Don't waste it. You have 24 hours in a day. Don't waste them. You have a God-given purpose. Do not miss it. Every person listening to this message, you are not alive by accident. I don't know who needs to hear this today, but you are not an accident. You were created by Almighty God himself. And he has a plan and a purpose for your life. In fact, I believe today that God is going to use this message to shake up some of us in a good way. He's going to inspire us to do the good works for which God created us to do. He's going to remind us of why he put us on planet Earth. In 1 Timothy, which is the book that we've been studying in this series, Paul, the author, he's writing towards the end of his own life. In fact, many scholars believe that 1 and 2 Timothy were two of Paul's last letters in the New Testament. And so he's writing to this young man named Timothy, who's a teenager, probably an early teenager, and he's giving him some advice. He's saying, hey, here's what I wish I would have known sooner. If you were writing to your kids or to someone like Timothy that you were mentoring, what would you write in that moment? Timothy, in chapter 6, Paul writes to him three verbs that I would describe as powerful strong verbs. You can almost hear Paul screaming through the pages at Timothy, do not waste your life. And these three verbs point us as well to the purpose that God has for us to live our one and only life. Here's the first way that you can make the most of your one and only life. It's this, you got to flee. Flee from distractions. Look at what Paul writes to Timothy in verse 11. He says, but you, O man of God, flee from all this. What is this? Well, look at the verse right before it. He says, some people eager for money have wandered from the faith. Ryan talked about this last weekend, that you can spend your whole life pursuing monetary wealth only to get to the end and realize true wealth is much greater than that. Paul says to Timothy, flee from that. In verse 4, he's talking about false teachers that have infiltrated the church. And he says they have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words. Paul says to Timothy, you got to flee that. 
That's all it's going to do is distract you. In verse 20, he says to Timothy, turn away from godless chatter. In other words, flee from distractions. Timothy, don't get caught up in a love for money. That will distract you from God's purpose for your life. Don't get caught up in quarrels about words and controversies. That's not really important at the end of the day. Timothy, I got something much bigger and greater for you. Turn away from godless chatter. That's a waste of your time and you won't fulfill your purpose. Do you know where there's a lot of godless chatter? I mean, it's really everywhere, but one of the places I see it the most is on social media. And I'm not against social media in any way, but I was just reading a study that found that the average American spends 5.4 hours every day on their phone. And that was a conservative study. There was another study that said the average American spends nine hours a day on their phone. Now, if you were to spend 5.4 hours every day on your phone, here's what that would add up to. In a year, you will have spent 1,971 hours on your phone. To put that into perspective, that's 82 full 24-hour days every year on the phone. If you were to live to be 80 years old, that would add up to 6,560 full 24-hour days. And the question I want to ask you is this. Is that what you want? At the end of your life, no one's going to go, bring me my phone, just one last scroll before I leave this earth. Is that what we want? One pastor that I was listening to said it this way. He said, if your enemy can't destroy you, he will distract you. If Satan can't destroy you, he's going to do everything he can to distract you from the purpose that God has for your life. How can any of us give God our undivided attention when there's always a ping, a bing, a buzz, a tweet, a twit, or a Fitbit going off someplace? The truth is, it's easier to scroll than it is to reflect. It's easier to tweet than it is to pray. And so we do. We scroll, we tap, we like. We check our phone 10 minutes later to see if somebody heart-faced emojied our picture. In that same study, it said that the average American checks their phone once every 10 minutes. Here's what that tells me. For the average person, there's nothing in their life outside of their phone that gets more than 10 minutes of their undivided attention. It is a fight to focus these days. Many years ago, I was speaking at an outdoor festival in Wisconsin, and Jeremy Sanoski, who's on staff with us now as one of our worship leaders, he was the opening act. And then I was speaking after him, and then Super Chick, which was a pretty popular Christian band back in the day. They were kind of the closing final act. And so Jeremy got up there with his electric guitar and he was just getting the crowd hyped. He was melting people's faces off with his electric guitar solos. And then it was my turn. And as Jeremy was walking down the steps back of the stage, he looked at me waiting to walk up and he goes, man, I don't know how you're going to do it. You got to try to keep that crowd's attention for 30 minutes using only your voice. He said, at least I had an electric guitar. <laughs> and he walked off. I was like, oh, th you know, thanks. So I get up there to speak, and he's right. I mean, I'm using only my voice to try to capture people's attention for 30 minutes. And it was actually going pretty well. At, at the very end, I was about to lead people in a prayer to put their faith in Jesus Christ. But right as I was about to say, if you would like to receive Christ, Super Chick's tour bus pulled up. And they pulled up right by the stage. It was a small town in Wisconsin. Apparently they had gone to Subway for dinner. And so the bus doors open and here comes Super Chick holding their Subways. And this kid in the front row stands up. He goes, Super Chick! And then the kid next to him was like, oh! And the parents are all looking around. <laughs> I'm like, does anybody want to receive Christ? I, I couldn't compare. I couldn't compete. I was listening to another pastor tell a similar story. He was on a plane ride 
trying to read his Bible, and the guy next to him was watching a movie on his iPad. And every time the pastor tried to read something in his Bible, there'd be an explosion of light in the seat next to him. Something blew up. There was an explosion, an inferno of fire, pixels of light dancing everywhere. Beautiful people dressed in provocative ways. There was an explosion of sound and laughter and screaming. It was like Super Chick just pulled up in the seat next to him. And this pastor said he looked down at his leather-bound Bible with words printed on crinkly paper. And he thought, there's no way that my Bible can compete with the sensory overload that's taking place in the seat next to me. I wonder sometimes if we are becoming addicted to a sensory overload, that our eyes crave pixels of light dancing before them at all times, that our ears want sound waves crashing over them, our minds are not used to having moments of silence. We are living in the generation of the fast forward, skip ad, instant internet connection. In fact, if my internet isn't connecting right away, I'm like, God, the Wi-Fi is terrible here. This is a joke. I, it's going up to space. Could, could, could you give it 15 seconds to go up to space and back? No, I can't, because my senses need to be engaged at all times. Friends, your purpose is too great, and your God is too good to waste your time on things that do not really matter. Don't let godless chatter pull you away from godly character. Because look at what Paul says to Timothy next. He says, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. I love this word pursue. What are you pursuing these days? When you wake up in the morning, what would you say is the thing that you're like, well, I'm, just, I'm going after that, I'm pursuing that, I want that. Some of us would say, well, I'm, I'm pursuing a relationship. You know, I'm, I'm pursuing a boyfriend or girlfriend. Some of us would say, I'm pursuing a career or an opportunity. There's this great opportunity, and I'm trying to figure out a way of how I can pursue it. We pursue all kinds of things, but anyone pursuing godliness? Anyone pursuing faith? Anyone pursuing gentleness? The word pursue implies that you've got a plan. That you wake up in the morning and you don't just think, oh, I'm just going to become a person of love and faith and godliness. But you actually have a plan. Here's how I'm pursuing those things. Paul says to Timothy, I wish I would have known sooner how important it is to pursue God. That is what brings meaning and purpose to life. But to do that, you've got to flee from distractions. Here's the second way to make the most of the life that God's given you, and it's this. You've got to fight for faith. You've got to flee, and then you've got to fight. Look at what he says in verse 12. He says to Timothy, fight the good fight of the faith. Faith is a fight. Several years ago, my wife had taken our kids to one of her cousin's weddings, and I was speaking at church, and so I had to stay home. So I had the house all to myself. And one afternoon, I thought, you know, I'm just going to spend some time praying. I normally don't have a quiet house. And so I paused, and I asked this question, God, what do you want to accomplish through my life? That's a powerful question. God, what do you want to accomplish through my life? And from that prayer, I wrote down 20 things, 20 things that at the end of my life, I hope to look back on and go, wow, God, look at what you did. And I've turned these 20 things into prayers. I pray these on a regular basis. God, would you do this in my life? Would you do this through me? One of them was that we could put an Eagle Brook campus in the west suburbs near where I grew up. And so when the Wyzetta campus opened a few years ago, I crossed that off my list and I just thanked God. I also have on there that my wife would feel cherished. And that's the specific word that I use. I, I've never told my wife that word, but I would frequently pray, God, I pray that my wife feels cherished by me. And then one day, out of the blue, my wife came up, gave me a hug, and she said, I feel so cherished by you lately. 
So what did I do? <laughs> Cross that off the list. Haven't cherished her since. I mean, there's no need. Tyra, done. Did it. Time to move on. But here, here's actually the first one. This is the most important prayer on the whole list to me personally, and it might surprise you what it is. The number one that I always list, and it's the one I pray the most frequently, is God, give me faith. God, give me more faith. Give me an ability to trust you every single day of my life. But that kind of faith doesn't just happen. You actually have to fight for it. You see, some people think that pastors and strong Christians, we wake up in the morning and we pull on our angelic underpants and we kind of just float through the day saying things like, oh, I'm too blessed to be depressed. I don't own a pair of those. I mean, I get crabby and irritable in the late afternoon, early evening. I have moments of great faith, but I have other moments where I struggle with doubt. I have moments where I'm filled with great joy, and I have other times where I can hardly force a smile. When things are going well, I'm like, yes, God, I believe. But then when things aren't going so well, all of a sudden I can lose my peace and start to worry. Faith is a fight. How do you get more faith? Well, look at what the Bible says in Romans 10. It says that faith comes from hearing. That's how you get faith. You, it comes from hearing. Hearing what? Hearing the good news about Christ. Another translation says hearing the word of God. You don't get faith hearing talk radio. You, you don't get faith listening to a podcast necessarily or, or some news program. You get faith when you open up your Bible and you quiet your soul and you say, God, would you speak to me right now? That's how you have faith. A few weeks ago, I was opening my Bible and just saying, God, would you speak to me? And I was reading in Mark chapter 9, and it's a story about this demon-possessed boy who's being brought to Jesus. And so Jesus turns to this boy's father, and he asks him, he says, how long has the boy had this issue? And, and the father responds back to Jesus. He says, from childhood. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But then he says to Jesus, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And I want you to see Jesus' response because I giggled when I read this in my Bible. I, mean, I just love how Jesus responds. He said this to the man. He says, if you can, question mark. He repeats it back to the guy because the guy said to Jesus, well, if you can help us, you know, we'd appreciate it. And Jesus is like, if you can said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. I wrote in the margin of my Bible that day, I said three words never to say to Jesus, if you can. Here's what you need to know today. He can. He can. You may want to write those two words on a piece of paper. You may want to put them on your phone. You may want to put them on the dashboard of your car to remind yourself, he can. Ephesians 3.20 says that God is able to do more than we've ever asked or imagined. He can. He is able. That's faith. Faith believes that God can. Faith trusts that no matter what's happening in your life, God can. That he is able to do more than we ever ask or imagine. Paul says to Timothy, you've got to fight the good fight of faith. Let me ask you, how do you need to fight for faith this week? For some of us, there's a lie that we've believed and it's taking our life off track. And you need to be intentional about replacing that lie with the truth of God's word. That's how you fight for faith. Some of us are struggling with anxiety and worry. And you need to pause and you need to pray, God, I cast that anxiety onto you right now. That is how you fight for faith. But you've got to fight for it. I'm telling you, at the end of your life, faith is going to be more valuable to you than your 401k. It is going to be more important to you than your handicap in golf. At that moment, at the end of your life, faith is going to be the thing that you want the most and need the most. 
You're going to say, God, I need to be able to trust you right now as I'm not feeling good, or I need to be able to trust you as I'm suffering, or I need to trust you as I step into the unknown. But I need to be reminded right now, God, that you can. And I need you to give me more faith. You want to make the most of your life. You've got to flee from distractions. You've got to fight for faith. And then you've got to take hold of eternal life. You've got to flee. You've got to fight. And you've got to take hold of eternal life. Look at what Paul says in the next verse. He says, take hold of the eternal life to which you were called, Timothy, when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I love the strength of that phrase, take hold. Some people think that because they grew up in a Christian home, or they'll say things like, you know, I, I've always believed that God exists. I mean, I was baptized when I was an infant. I was confirmed when I was, you know, in middle school. I mean, I, we went to the Methodist church. We went to the Lutheran church. I mean, I've, I've always considered myself a Christian. I, I grew up in America. But that's not how it works. You got to take hold of eternal life. You've got to have a moment where you confess your sins and you put your faith in Jesus Christ. It doesn't just happen. You have to reach out and take hold of it. You've probably heard someone say that growing up in a Christian home doesn't make you a Christian any more than growing up in a garage would have made you a car. And that's true. You've got to take hold of it. Have you done that? No one is ever going to ask you a more important question. What if you lived your whole life and it was a good life? I mean, you raised amazing kids financially. You did quite well. You had a lot of fun. You even overcame some adversity. But then you died. And you didn't go to heaven. You went to be separated from God for all of eternity. Would you feel good about that? I wouldn't. That's why when I was 19 years old and I became convinced that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, I got down on my knees in my dorm room, put my hands on the couch, looked out the window up at the immense sky and stars, and I confessed my sins, and I said, Jesus Christ, I put my faith in you right now. I took a hold of it didn't just happen by being a good person or growing up in a Christian home or believing that God exists. I had to have a moment where I say, God, I confess my sins and put my faith in you. I am going to take hold of it. And we all need that. When we receive communion together, we are confessing our sins and we are remembering the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on the cross. The night before Jesus was betrayed, he was having a meal with his closest followers and he broke a loaf of bread in half. And using it as an illustration, he said, this is my body broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. He then took a cup and he raised it up and he said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. And so when we receive communion with one another, we are remembering the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made. Now today, we're going to be receiving communion in our homes and in all kinds of places throughout the state of Minnesota and maybe even the world. And I'm really praying today this wouldn't be flippant. This wouldn't be something where it's just a, you know, a nice little snack in the morning, have some juice, eat a you know, cracker or bread. But I'm hoping that you will pray. And this will be a holy moment for you. If you're already a follower of Jesus Christ, would you take a moment and confess your sins to God and then begin to pray and say, God, give me more faith. Give me an ability to trust you for whatever I need to trust you with in my life this week. And if you're not a follower of Christ, but you say today, you know what? Today's my day. Today is my day to take hold of eternal life. It's not just going to kind of happen. I have to reach out and take hold of it then take communion today as a sign that you are putting your faith in Jesus Christ. And I want to invite you to pray this prayer and just say, God, I confess my sins to you. 
and be as specific as you can. And then say, Jesus Christ, I'm putting my faith and my trust in you right now. I'm asking you to save me and to forgive me. And then begin that new relationship. In fact, if you pray that prayer today, would you text the word begin to this number, 555-888, or if you're on Facebook Live right now, just comment down in the comment section, begin. We have a 12-week resource guide we want to give to you. It's completely free. We don't want you just to have an emotional moment. We want you to start a relationship with God and begin to pursue him with your life. But I really believe that for some of you, today is your day. Today is your day to take hold of it. To grab onto eternal life and never look back. As all of this is happening, our band is going to be playing some music. And then they're going to lead us in a closing song that just says, God, I am desperate for you. I'm lost without you. And we are, we are, we are so lost without God. But the good news is that we have a friend in Jesus Christ. When you put your faith in him, Jesus Christ isn't just a thought or an idea. He becomes a friend. You have a relationship with him. And it's that relationship that will give purpose and meaning to your life. One last time, do not waste your life. Take hold of eternal life. Flee from distractions. And fight for faith. Let's receive communion with one another.
Jesus, I think that we are all in a season of desperation. We're desperate for hope and we're desperate to feel your presence with us. We're all experiencing some kind of a trial right now, some kind of a doubt, some kind of anxiety. And I pray that no matter what we're facing right now, if we lose sight of you, Lord, that you remind us that you are for us that you are not against us, that you are our friend forever, and that we need you, Jesus. Thank you for loving us.